Good afternoon. Welcome to the second day of the Eyes on Earth online roadshow. My name is Martijn Seiger and I'm your host. This afternoon's session is in collaboration with OICOM, the Croatian Environmental Consultancy and Research Institute, and Creo Dias, one of the Dias partners. Please be informed that this session is in Croatian as well as in English. But before we start, I want to give the floor to Mr. Ayosha Dupic. Mr. Ayosha Duplic is acting director of the Institute for Environment and Nature Conservation, which is an expert analytical body of the Ministry of Environment and Energy. Mr. Duplic has a PhD in biology and has 15 years of experience in the field of conservation biology, ichthyology, zoology, zoology and ecology, and has numerous research papers regarding scientific areas mentioned. During those 15 years, he worked at the State Institute for Nature Protection, as well as lecturer at the University of Karlovac. And he was head of the expert division for nature at the Croatian Agency for Environment and Nature. Mr. Duplic, may I invite you? Hello. Could I start with the presentation? Okay, I will start the sharing. So, hello once again from Zagreb, and uh, thank you very much, first of all, to uh, organizers for reaching out of uh, the Croatian Ministry of Environment and Energy, and of course, giving us the opportunity to participate as a program partner for the thematic field for nature protection and climate change. This is a very important uh, topic uh, for us. Uh, and regarding that and all uh, challenges that we have uh, in a further uh, decades um, in front of us, uh, a very important tool uh, to, to, that we will use uh, in our work. So I would like uh, now shortly to present you um, a task that we are dealing with and uh, for what uh, we are using uh, data and we have in plan to use especially uh, uh, this type uh, of uh, monitoring and collecting of data. Uh, so, uh, on one of the main tasks of the Institute for Environment and Nature Inside Ministry is the collection and harmonization and analysis of environmental and nature uh, data, uh, which has the purpose in implementation of the environmental and nature protection policy, especially of sustainable use of natural resources and decreasing of environmental uh, or ecological footprint. Uh, additionally, it is crucial for development of measures and actions and strategic planning, and uh, especially in this moment when we have a totally new um, uh, framework, uh, uh, strategic framework uh, for environmental uh, and nature conservation uh, policies in uh, EU in document uh, Green Deal. Uh, so one, uh, in addition, the ministry uh, performs administrative and prof professional work and administrative supervision uh, and supervision uh, of professional work of public institutions uh, such as Environmental Protection and Energy Efficiency Fund, Croatian Meteorological and Hydrological Service, Croatian Waters, which are um, um, management authority for waters in Croatia, and also public institutions uh, uh, for uh, nature uh, protection as national uh, parks, nature parks, or on a regional level, um, uh, county public uh, 
uh, institutions uh, which are managing uh, uh, protected areas and uh, sites of uh, ecological uh, network. Uh, the Institute for Environment and Nature as a part of ministry has been uh, to this uh, day responsible for establishment, also development, management and coordination of environmental and nature information systems. So we have two of them. And these information systems are the main sources of national uh, environmental and nature data. And of course, basis for uh, management, for planning, for uh, assessments, uh, and uh, so on. So uh, present uh, challenges uh, for the ministry do not significantly differ uh, from those seen in uh, other parts of the world. In that respect, climate crisis and biodiversity crisis is, uh, uh, of course, one of the biggest challenge uh, which we all face. Uh, there are of course, uh, numerous actions which are trying to mitigate the negative effects of human uh, impacts on the world, on the whole earth, and for that purpose, having uh, the right data uh, in the right uh, time is uh, essential and crucial for us uh, to adequately tackle uh, issues in all domain, domains and to try and uh, reverse negative trends uh, which the European Green Deal is set to solve. We need to use more data and information uh, gathered uh, and extracted from satellite uh, imagery. This is not a source of data that is becoming important, but it has be, became one of the most important data source, as I already said. Uh, so this makes satellite Im, Im, imagery uh, data an essential tool for analyzing uh, status and trends, which is an unavoidable uh, stage in the policy and uh, decision-making process. So experts in our um, unit are, and also not just in, in, in institute, but also in whole ministry are using uh, geospatial data on a daily basis for uh, various tasks and uh, reasons, which range from making uh, some uh, uh, analytical work, uh, defining zones for habitats uh, or species protection and management, and creating the basis for national and uh, European reports, but also uh, uh, for communication uh, with public, with uh, decision makers. In addition, uh, we are uh, also a public provider of geospatial data for uh, different uh, fields, which includes air quality, climate change, soil, the waste management, uh, then also protected areas, ecosystem services, biodiversity, uh, and so on. All these data are provided through our information uh, system solutions and services, uh, such as Envy Environmental, Atlas, and um, Bio uh, Portal. Uh, so, which needs we have? The needs are uh, many and uh, they address different problems from uh, detection of built up and burned areas, air quality for different uh, pollutants, for example, to the onset of drought, marine habitat and pollution detection uh, detection of um, rough tops uh, made uh, of uh, asbestos or some other uh, things. 
these examples only uh, show uh, the need for better uh, usage of satellite data, which also gives us one uh, other advantage, and that is time. So at this moment, we can say that honestly, we doesn't use all these opportunities on the way and um, in uh, uh, in uh, amount that we should. And that is, for example, for us really challenge how to make a quick and effective change in our everyday work and use of satellite data uh, in a quick period of a uh, year or two uh, and to improve our uh, work and data uh, that we are providing to different kind of users and of course uh, to to uh, to improve uh, quality of uh, our work and uh, time and money that we are uh, spending uh so uh on the end i would like to thank you all once again uh and uh, also i hope that this will be great opportunity for making uh, new ideas and creating solutions as as well for learning about satellite data and space te technology especially in time when we need transformative change, uh, when we need to go in whole sectors, um, uh, really when we uh, have um, uh, need, but not just need, also opportunity um, to, to, to make uh, mainstreaming of uh, nature conservation and uh, environmental issues to all sectors and to make um, really use of all these uh, natural resources uh, sustainable. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Duplich. Um, uh, one question, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Duplich, thank you for your kind words and uh, very good to stress the importance of the need to carefully use natural resources in relation to limited ecological impact. We're also very pleased to be informed on the wide scope of the Institute and the available information systems uh, to face the challenges of, for example, you mentioned air quality and marine spatial planning issues and also sharing your, your needs about how to solve these societal challenges with the help of satellite and especially Copernicus data. So I hope this roadshow inspires the audience uh, to provide you the services which you need to solve these challenges. And once again, I would like to thank you very much for your, for your um, contribution to the roadshow. And I would like to um, proceed uh, with the presentation of OICOM. And OICON will present three cases. And after the presentation of OICON, we will get a presentation of Creo Diaz. And Creo Diaz is one of the Diaz partners, and they can tell you all about uh, the use of satellite data for societal questions. May I inform you that during the presentation, you can submit questions in the text box on your screen, and the speakers will answer as many as possible given the time after the presentations. Igor, Branimir, and Stanislav. May I invite you to get the floor? Thank you very much. Hello, and welcome to uh, OICON's session on this uh, during this Earth Observation Summit. Uh, first of all, I would like to do a short introduction about OICON Institute of Applied Ecology and also the Cloudfero team. Uh, Cloudfero is the main operator of Creo Diaz, one of the, the European Diaz's. My name is Brani Miradun and I'm a professional associate at uh, OICON Institute of Applied Ecology. OICON 
is is a consultancy with more than twenty with twenty two years of experience and over one hundred one thousand four hundred successfully completed projects. Uh, we are focused on pragmatic, practical, and implementable solutions uh, that are affor affordable and neat. Uh, the company is a holder of top international ISO standards and AAA certificates, and also we are a carrier uh, of the Croatian quality label. Uh, Oikon is one of three representatives of Croatia in the Copernicus Academy network and the only private company uh, that is there from Croatia. Uh, more about Oikon. Oikon is a leading uh, licensed and accredited environmental uh, uh, consultancy and also we are a certified research institute in Croatia. Uh, we are a research-based SME, to put it more simple. We are structured in four departments. Department of Environmental Engineering, Department of Nature Protection and Landscape Architecture, Department of Natural Resource Management and Department of Environmental Law, Policy and Economics. Horizontally, uh, as a scientific network between the, those four departments, we have four laboratories. They are the Laboratory for Remote Sensing and GIS, Laboratory for Data Science, uh, Laboratory for Research and Monitoring of Large Carnivores, and Laboratory for Fish and Aquatic Ecosystems. Uh, our departments, the Department of National Resource Management and the Laboratory of Remote Sensing and GIS, uh, uh, do the most work in the field of Earth observation and remote sensing. And through the, through the use of the remote sensing and Earth observation, they make Koikon one of a major one of the major providers of EO services in many fields. One of those some of those fields are forestry applications, land use, land cover and habitat mapping, nature conservation, uh, agricultural applications, water monitoring and protection, and many other uh, uh, in the field of applied ecology. We uh, we have a strong uh, partner partner and membership uh, network. We are members of several large organizations in the field of Earth observation. Also, our uh, list of partners is quite big and it's getting uh, larger every day. Also, I would like to uh, say something about Cloud Faro. Cloud Faro uh, is joining us during uh, the Q and A later, so they are open for questions. Cloudfero is a Polish technological company founded in 2015 offering highest quality cloud computing services for specialized market segments. It builds and operates cloud platforms focused on acquisition and processing of big data such as Earth observation satellite data and its derivatives. Over the last five years, Cloudfero has become one of the leading big data, in, big data enabled cloud services providers for the European space sector. Building and operating a number of large scale platforms uh, one of which are Wikio and Creodias, one of the five Copernicus dioceses. Creodias is a cloud infrastructure adapted to processing, sorry, to processing big amounts of EO data, including uh, EO storage clusters and dedicated infrastructure as service cloud infrastructure uh, for the platform for the platform's users. The main idea of Creodias platform is based on putting close together a big data repository and customer accessible computer computing resources for an open and flexible work environment. The processing resources are open, are open source and compliant with the world standards. Creo Diaz architecture is based on renowned open source solutions, OpenStack for cloud computing and CEPH for storage. Therefore, it is easy to migrate to Creo Diaz with no risk of technological lock-ins. Uh, the Creo Diaz Earth Observation Data Repository contains different products of Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, 5P and P and, f uh, and 5 uh, systems and also Landsat 5, 7 and 8 uh, systems. Other than that, data from, uh, from Envisat and ESMO systems are also available. Additionally, sets of Copernicus service data is available locally for Copernicus Atmosphere, Emergency, and Land mar and Marine Service. Currently, the repository is over 16 petabytes of satellite imagery and its derivatives and will glow beyond 20 petabytes by the end of the year. Data discovery and access to, uh, in the Creodia system, Creodia environment is easy and accessible thanks to the set of specialized tools and inter interfaces. Uh, 
Thank you again. Uh, enjoy next few sessions and please feel free to join us during the Q&A. Hi everybody. So my name is Ivan and I'm the head of the Remote Sensing and GIS Laboratory here at Icon Institute. And today I would love to talk to you about Earth observation in agriculture and actually present you a journey from an image in space to a tree in your orchard. So let's start. Um, space, the final frontier, a uh, well-known saying, I hope you know it. If not, we're going to talk about it. Um, so you heard all, you, all of you heard about NASA, and NASA is the, well, American Space Agency. Well, Europe has its own, and it's called ESA, or the European Space Agency. It's been around since 1975, and the headquarters are in Paris, France. Um, it's an intergovernmental organization consisting of 22 member states dedicated to the exploration of space. And thanks to ESA, we also have a Copernicus program, and Copernicus program has a lot of satellites up in the orbit. When by a lot, I mean Sentinel mission, among others. And within the Sentinel mission, we have right now around, I think, four or five of them, and there are still some that are going to be launched. Uh, here on the image on the side, you can see a sample of a image of Sentinel-2, from Sentinel-2 data, and it's representing part of the, of the Earth's surface. Uh, why is this important for us? It's important because we use this kind of imagery in our work, where without direct uh, confrontation with the surface or direct measurements, we passively or second-handly can measure some elements on the Earth and use it in our, for our own advantage and to generate final outcomes and products. Um, where can you get this kind of a data? Well, there's also something called a DS, and DS is a data and information access service. Um, the whole thing was started by ESA, and some of the most um, recognized DSs right now is the Creo DS, which you heard something about at the beginning. Then you have Onda, Mundi, and others. This is where you can register uh, for free and then you can go and download the data and play around with it. And it's completely free. So after all of this, if you're interested, please go there, take a look and play around and see maybe if you could do something with this data. And yeah, who knows? Just go there and have some fun. Uh, Earth observation in agriculture is a very hot topic recently. So there are many things going on from precision agriculture to other elements. Um, the interesting and the cool thing about it is that Sentinel data can be brought down to a spatial resolution of 10 meters, which from our point of view is fantastic in regards to these things that are up in the space. Um, the most important part of the whole system and really good one for the agriculture is the near infrared imagery. It's very good for vegetation because chlorophyll reacts very well in this spectrum and then we can see what's going on with the leaf and the canopy and similar. All in all, once you, when, when you're playing around with these images and um, you want to extract some information, when it comes to agriculture you can produce a lot of things. So you can check up on crop status, you can see the nitrogen levels and then you can also monitor biomass. You can check for the irrigation or the canopy covers. And these are just few things you can do. There's many others, well, let's say there's plethora of other things that you can take a look at and observe. Another main instance here is that it's very easy to cover large areas of territory in a very short amount of time. And this was really interesting for us here at Oikon because we wanted to do something with this kind of data and see what we can actually do to benefit everybody. So what we did, we did some mapping of the agricultural land in Croatia. Um, this was the first time that EO techniques were applied in a whole territory of the Republic of Croatia, and in this case for agricultural purposes. 
Um, we use a combination of remote sensing and machine learning, and especially when it comes to satellites or the data sources, we use Sentinel-1 and 2, multi-temporal data, plus the ELPIS. And ELPIS is another element uh, within the European Union, and that's the Land Parcel Information System, where everybody who's applying for subsidies from the EU and the governments can register their own land parcel and state the purpose or the, the land use for their parcels, uh, the ones they are working with. We use this system to train the classifier and to see what's going on on the rest of the, of the, of the ground cover that, that was not under the ELPA system. Uh, altogether, we use a supervised classification, so we were monitoring what's going on during the whole process. We use random forest classifier, and all in all, we produced six final classes in total. So it was arable land, orchards, grassland, pasture, vineyards, and olive trees. These six classes represent the core, and they have very, very much uses on the governmental and local elements, especially for subsidies and similar things. The scale we used was 1 to 5,000, and this was the first time in the history of our country that such a high scale uh, was done for the territory of the whole country. Minimum mapping surface, or the minimum sur minimal uh, surface that was um, that you are able to see from this from this map is three hundred square meters. Now, this was an interesting project, but it still had one underlying factor, and that was um, we we had this need to count the trees in the orchard and the olive groves. And for this purpose, we decided to go down to the tree level. So let's count. We knew the position of the orchard and the olive groves because we calculated that in the step before and we knew the total area. But what we were lacking here was the numbers or the number of, of the trees and olives in the olive grove and the trees in the orchards. And for this, we were also not sure if the 10 meter resolution would be quite good for that. We needed a higher resolution satellite data. So in the next step here, you can see a part of the land surface where we previously identified an olive grove. So we decided to use object-based image analysis and template matching techniques to generate a set of a set of um, templates that we're going to use later on to discover all the trees on the part of the land that we wanted to work with. Uh, for this, we needed a higher resource data or higher resolution, so we decided to use digital order photo, which has a two meter resolution, and it was given to us by the government. On the slide here, you can see the process of picking out the template elements where by hand you had to click or point to the things you're looking for. In this case, it was the olive tree. Uh, it's not only a few samples, it can go from uh, tens to hundreds. And then from all this data together, you produce one mega sample. And this sample you can see as a picture number three. What happens next is that you take this mega sample or this mega universal olive tree, let's call it that way, and you run it over your raster data. It generates a like likelihood matrix that goes from zero, from zero to one, which basically can translate to percentage. So let's say zero to a hundred percent. You get something similar as what you can see on a picture number two and number one. This is really cool because then based on the likelihood, we can recognize if something might be a tree or not. Another problem we had at this point is that you have the matrix and you have the area, but you don't have the single trees. So we had to cut up the whole thing a little bit. And for this, we use the chessboard segmentation, which is an object-based image approach. 
And the interesting thing here is that once you cut it up, you have something that looks like a chessboard field, and thus the name, chessboard segmentation. In our case, we decided to go with the size of two by two pixels. And since our one pixel is two meters wide and long, we got a total surface of um, 16 square meters. Why? Because we, uh, we didn't go with a smaller one. <clears throat> because we didn't want to get a size smaller than a predicted size of a <clears throat> olive tree canopy. In this case, after some analysis, we decided that this would be the perfect size for it. This final slide here shows you what you get as an output once you decide on what percentage of likelihood would be enough to call something an olive tree. In our case, we decided that everything that has a likelihood higher than 65% could actually be called an olive tree. And after some further analysis, we finally got the final result. And you can see it here, where the green dots represent the trees. So this is a really cool and interesting method of how using satellite data, you could zoom in down to the orchard tree level or olive groves, groves and you can really, really see what's going on and you can count things. Uh, this is interesting because we use the collected data or the calculated data to calculate also the density of the orchard and the olive groves. And this also helps us better to understand the trends that are going on when it comes to tree growing in Croatia. Another good thing is it gives us a better insight on the shortcomings of some of the areas. And this can help also for the policymakers within the government or in general, even the private sectors, and helps us to monitor and correlate production for the whole element. And there are many other uses out there too. Um, all these things you can learn at the various outsources. Some of them is the Faculty of uh, Geodesy and Geoinformatics at the University of Zagreb. Also at the Faculty of Agronomy uh, Studies, also at the University of Zagreb. And finally, here at OICON with us, within the UniGIS Zagreb, uh, we are the study center for the UniGIS Salzburg. And all these places are perfect start points whenever you decide that you want to learn more about these things. Thank you for your time and hope to catch up soon. Uh, hello, I'm Zrinka Mesic. I'm a biologist from, Institute, from OICON Institute of Applied Ecologists and I will present you what my colleague and me have been, uh, how, have been how we have been applying Earth observation for nature conservation in more than last 20 years, uh, what are our experience. So when we talk the, about nature conservation and about the goal, one of the goal would, could be to, present, to protect uh, some pristine nature and really extraordinary things like this Plitvice Lakes National Park, which have some special features. Uh, which are not, uh, which you can't find somewhere else. But some other part of nature are like this nature park, Loinsko Polje, where uh, you have pastures and uh, forests. So maybe some more common part of nature that we can see, but all together composed in a in a special in a special way to make a really important part for to protect biodiversity in our country. Uh, or, or maybe like this nature park, Velebit, where you have a really big area uh, with the forest and mountains. And so it's easy to, to see what, what, what we want to protect here. It's really pristine nature. But what do we focus on in nature protection? Uh, it's not just on the pictures, it's basically everything is based on a, this is a food, uh, food web, uh, not from Europe, it's uh, from Africa, but it will, I will try to explain 
on this picture what what is the focus of nature uh, conservation so uh, here you can see the all um, different part of nature which are plants and animals and how are they connected who eats whom and uh, what is the what is their connection so what we want to what are we focusing in nature conservation sometimes we focus on one on one animal like this uh, but also it could be other part of any part of this web that we are uh, interested in to protect maybe even some not just animals but some special uh, plants as well so how can we observe this from the from the space um, basically the only part that we can observe is just the plants and the things that are related to amount of chlorophyll and the things that we can observe is also what is the structure of the leaves and those are the things that we are using to uh, present to, and to describe the nature uh, nature parts or maybe we can even use some other features like some other uh, plant uh, pigments and uh, the things that 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 you have the uh, start of the growing of the leaf or maybe senescence like this and those are the things that we can observe from the space so we are quite limited on just one part of this food web just this plant part related to the to the plants so the main topics that in nature conservation we cover would be biodiversity and things that we describe with biodiversity quite often are related to habitat types and habitats and habitat types uh, second thing would be landscape ecology is quite often related to management of natural resources like for uh, things also quite often connect with other sectors like forestry, agriculture, water management. Uh, and there are two other uh, topics that I've um, um, pointed out, what would like to present here is also invasive species and green infrastructure, things more related to urban ecology. So how to describe uh, what is the biodiversity conservation and how does this function and what is related to habitat types? So this is the animal that is uh, That is not from Europe is from China and it's quite often one of the flag species that when you want when you talk about nature conservation is panda so panda bear um, so this bear what what does this um, animal eat is bamboo so what are we interested how to protect this very very uh, endangered species is to protect to find where the bamboo forests are and how can we do this is to make a map like this of the this is the map of china forests with basic basic habitat types descriptions and what help us in protection of these species is to find where this forests related to bamboo bamboo forests are. So this is this is the uh, principle that we use in nature conservation and how do we use the data from earth observation. So this is picture from one one part of Croatia. So what can we do in in vert uh, in uh, earth observation is to map things like coniferous forests, broadleaf forests, uh, grasslands, uh, settlements and agriculture. So when we have uh, types which are basic like this, this is very quite simple to, to map from the earth observation data. But if we want to make something that is more detailed, which quite often we need in uh, nature conservation, that the things are getting more complicated. This is a one of the first uh, application of uh, earth observation in Croatia for this is how to make a habitat map. We were making habitat map of Croatia in 2000 and uh, we started in 2003 and finished in 2005 and we used Landsat data for doing this and final map was the uh, habitat type map of all Croatia 
and it has 109 habitat type class. So to compare this to um, Koreanland cover, which has roughly 50 classes, so this is far more classes than this. So this is what, what we want. We quite often need more classes to describe the, the nature features. Uh, another example is this on the above picture, uh, on the top picture is grassland, which has maybe 10 species. And the bottom picture is also grassland, but it has maybe 50 species. So how to uh, observe this from the, uh, from the space? And this is a challenge, and this is the thing that we are, we are working on, and it's not often easy to have enough resolution to, this, to do this, to have this type of the fine, fine things, uh, fine details that could be mapped. Um, for this, we are using uh, data for, from uh, satellite images, uh, classification, but also orthophoto and quite intensive field work. Uh, so this was the this is the example of one making habitat type map of one uh, one uh, uh, island in Croatia where we uh, had eighty one habitat type classes. So just to show you this is in how many details we have to go and what is our uh, focus to, to do this. So coming back to landscape ecology and to this food web uh, picture, uh, I'll try to explain it with one example which is related to bats that we were doing. So we were doing one um, environmental impact assessment study and research related to bats that, uh, that was the uh, the road was need to be built, and before that, we've been uh, researched how this part where the road should be built was used by bats, and where the earth comes observation come here is where we need to do the habitat type map to connect this data the, that we've been uh, researching, and finally we've been we've been. Um, mapping, uh, we made a map degree of a habitat usage. So this is the map where you can see where, which part of nature is more used and it's, let's say, more important for this bat species. So how have we done this habitat map? So basically it was done with, uh, with orthophoto, but also a uh, high resolution layer of a land cover could be used and uh, uh, the, so the layers like this, data like this could be used for, for doing this kind of maps. This is a picture of one horse but he was not at a hairdresser. It's uh, the other thing that happened here. Is This is a horse that is was pasturing on this pasture in Lonsko Polje Nature Park and you can see this in front of these horses, this um, um, brown brown species and those species are this rock, um, is uh, Xanthium stromarium species which has, which is invasive species and as you can see it causes a little bit of trouble to this horse. Um, so this is a story about invasive species. It's quite a big problem for native biodiversity because it reduces it. It's a problem for native habitats as well. And native uh, also has negative economic impacts and can cause a human health issues as well. Another thing is, uh, example is uh, this Amorpha fruticosa, also invasive species where we've been uh, mapping it and it caused in this the same area, uh, Loisko Polje Nature Park, it's been overgrown uh, either as monoculture or it's just present in some habitats and you can see it's coming up to 27% of the habitat uh, could, could be overgrown by the species. So we've been using Sentinel-2 to make a biomass model and use different uh, bands for, for uh, making a model of it. We'd also use the leader 
for identification of the parts where this uh, plant is present. So this is the, the maps that we've been producing and later this could be used by the nature conservation uh, officers to they were interested which parts, what is the biomass that could be used if they cut down this invasive species and what, how could be used later on. So black locust is another uh, invasive species that was used. We've been also using sentinel to try to identify where this species is uh, present and it was quite a good model uh, for, it was, uh, we had a good results in defining it with the sentinel to uh, data. Another thing is, another example is this oak lake bulk, which uh, lays back uh, that uh, is just a few millimeters big uh, insect. And it causes this that you can see this on the picture. It's reducing the amount of chlorophyll. The, my colleague will uh, say more about this. So if we've been using, we've been. Um, mapping this uh, effect of reducing uh, the, the um, photosynthesis uh, caused by this bulb and uh, with the MODIS NDVI uh, pictures. But how does this relate to, this is more maybe related to forestry, but how does this relate to na nature conservation is that we have Natura 2000, which is a network of uh, protected areas in Europe, and also Croatia has 36% of the Natura 2000 areas and those areas are also the Quercus, Quercus species uh, parts where um, we, which are part of Natura 2000 areas. So to protect them we need to have the information how is this uh, species spread around the, the, the the Croatia, so it's uh, it's something that it could be not just in this eastern part, but all over, if because it's related to all Quercus species. Uh, another story is about green infrastructure, which is related to how to protect, among other, how to protect the biodiversity in towns, in urban areas. So we've been doing one study in. Zagreb town is my uh, hometown, so uh, it's where one of the thing is in this uh, analysis we use the uh, Copernicus high resolution layers to map the imperviousness part, so also uh, we use uh, the same layers to um, map the uh, what is the uh, greenness of this of of the, the town and this area. And also one thing related to heat islands, which is uh, we use Landsat image to try to identify where are the parts which are the having uh, high, high temperatures. Uh, and uh, so this was done by Landsat, but it could be used with Sentinel-2 as well, uh, images with. It's just that we didn't have uh, at that time available um, good um, sentinel image and um, so we map the what is the temperature of each part of uh, Zagreb town and accordingly if we connected this data with the greenness of each of this uh, part of a town and this could be helped later in decision which part could be should be used more effort to have more green areas to reduce this heat island effect. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and welcome to the Earth Observation for Forest Ecosystem Monitoring presentation. I am, my name is Brani Miradun and I am a professional associate at OICON Institute of Applied Ecology. Uh, to understand forest ecosystems, we need to first think of their scale, what they encompass. Forest ecosystems are very complex systems and they are home to many countless different animal and plant species. Uh, they all, all depend on the health of and the status of that ecosystem. But of course, we know that intuitively the most dominant life form of forest is a tree. 
uh, following that, the health of those trees that, that make the forest ecosystem uh, is one of the most important indicators of the state of the entire ecosystem. Uh, parameters that indicate the health of uh, trees in the ecosystem and their instability, there are many parameters, but just one of many are the growth rate of trees, the sap flow dynamics of liquids inside a tree, uh, the phenology, which basically means the time where they leave and where the leaves grow uh, yellow when they, when they fall out, and the leaf chlorophyll content. And that, of course, means how green the leaves are. But uh, evaluating one tree doesn't uh, give us any idea about the entire ecosystem. As the saying says, one tree does not make a forest. To conclude anything about the state of the forest ecosystem, we need to look at the entire forest from a much larger scale. Lately, the breakthroughs in UAV and the cost-benefit ratio with, that came with mass production of UAVs made uh, drones or UAV uh, systems one of the most dominant ways of studying forest ecosystems, but they have severe limitations. Uh, they are uh, limited by the high height of their flight, by the quality of their sensor, by time of flight, and of course they cannot uh, record very big uh, forest ecosystems. So uh, basically for large scale studies we depend on uh, Earth observation satellite data. Using Earth observation satellite data for uh, forest ecosystem monitoring is nothing new. It's been around since the 70s, uh, since the uh, beginning of ray operations of the first uh, civilian uh, Earth observation system, the Landsat system, operated by NASA and USGS. In the image you can see uh, the area around New Jersey and New York, the forests uh, around that area, uh, basically studying uh, ecosystem, forest ecosystems with Earth observation goes back a long time. But lately, uh, in the last five to ten years, there, have, there has been a huge, huge improvement. Uh, there are now many optical and radar Earth observation systems in orbit and many of, the, of them are used to record different parameters about the state of the forest ecosystems. <clears throat> the two main institutions that are the owners of those Earth observation systems are of course the European Space Agency and NASA. Uh, when it comes to monitoring uh, specific uh, parameters in the forest ecosystem, we need to use different sensors and conclude, uh, conclude uh, the state of those, the, of, those, of those parameters and following that the state of the entire ecosystem. Those parameters can uh, range from uh, using multispectral data to, uh, examine, uh, to examine the, the, the chlorophyll content in the leaves, the canopy density indicators uh, the, from the indexes like uh, NDVI and leaf area index. Uh, we can use radar data, SAR data to uh, monitor deforestation dynam dynamics. Uh, radar systems are very important for those type of ty those type of studies because uh, SAR radar systems are active sensors. They don't do not de they depend on the energy uh, from the sun but they depend on, on their own signal. So they send a signal and uh, make an image from, from their, own, their own signal. Basically that means that they are independent from uh, day-night situations. They can record during night and also the radar signal goes through smoke, smoke and clouds. That's very important for tropical areas. Uh, one of the biggest uh, deposits of forest life, of forest ecosystems are around tropical areas. And uh, those areas are quite often very cloudy, so it's difficult to uh, monitor legal or, or, or illegal deforestation in tropical areas. <clears throat> we can also use uh, radar systems to detect soil moisture content. Of course, soil moisture is very important for life in general, but especially important for forest ecosystems. Also, uh, earth observation systems are used to uh, to study forest productivity parameters. Forest productivity uh, parameters are very important for uh, for nations, for countries to know to know with, with how much forest they the, they can they can manage and how much forest they have. 
And of course, there are forest fires. Forest fires are uh, very, it's very clear that they have a huge and terrible impact in the forest ecosystems. Uh, we can use optical systems to monitor active forest fires and, uh, and also recent forest fires and conclude their impact in, into the forest ecosystem. <clears throat> Out of all those systems, out of all the systems that are in orbit, uh, there are four that we use in practice the most. Uh, the two, two are from uh, operated by NASA and USGS. Those are the Landsat 8 system, the, the, the grand, grand, grand child of the first Landsat satellite that we mentioned earlier. It has uh, the OLI sensor, the Operational Land Imager Multispectral Sensor. <clears throat> And also the MODI system. Uh, MODI system uh, is consisted of twin satellites, Aqua and Terra. Uh, MODI provides different uh, products that uh, mo many of them uh, have a huge impact in studying forest ecosystems. But in the last four or five years, the most important uh, systems today globally are the ESA, ESA EO systems. <clears throat> Out of them, uh, we mostly use Sentinel-2 systems. So Sentinel-2 is consisted of twin satellites, Sentinel-2 A and B. Each of them is carrying a multispectral instrument, recording uh, multispectral images on 30 separate uh, spectral channels. Uh, three of them are in the visible, in the visible spectrum, so uh, red, green and blue, and the other 10 are in the uh, uh, part of the spectrum that's invisible to the human eye. Also, we, we uh, use Sentinel-1 data. Uh, Sentinel-1 is a radar satellite, si satellite system that consists out of twin uh, SAR, radar, uh, radar uh, systems, operating on C-band uh, radar. Its operational since 2014. Just to get a clear view about the differences, practical differences between those uh, those some of those systems. Here are three optical systems that we use the most. Uh, each image has its own spatial resolution, which means the ground sample distance, the one, one how how much area of the uh, of the Earth uh, is covered by one pixel of the image. Uh, the green, uh, the yellow square represents the pixel in a modis modis uh, image. Its spatial resolution is 250 meters by 250 meters. <clears throat> Following that, you can see the Landsat 8 spatial resolution, which is 30 by 30 meters. And lastly, Sentinel-2, which at the best has 20 by 20 uh, meters spatial resolution. Uh, Sentinel-2 also for some bears has a rougher spatial, uh, spatial resolution, but the most of the data that we use is 20 by 20 meters. But also a very impo important aspect is the temporal resolution. Uh, that means the time uh, that is uh, that passes uh, before uh, each satellite revisits a place on Earth. Put more simply, how of how soon can we get another image of our location from that system? So the products that we use from the MODIS system has a temporal resolution of 16 days. Basically, it, it creates a 16-day composites. Landsat 8 also has has a temporal resolution of 16 days. But Sentinel, Sentinel satellites have a temporal resolution of five days, which is a huge improvement. And that means that Sentinel Earth observation data has become a new standard in studying forest ecosystems. Not just forest ecosystems, but use of Earth observation data in general. <clears throat> Earth observation data provided mainly by the Sentinel systems is used to provide forest mapping and forest change mapping. Uh, to produce supporting uh, maps, maps supported uh, that support the national class, uh, inventories of forests. Also, they are used to, the, to determine the, the spatial distribution of different types of forests and their biophysical variables. The aforementioned sentinels are just a part of the Copernicus program. Uh, Copernicus program has different many different uh, many different services, and one that is the most trustworthy source nowadays for of knowledge about European forest is the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service. Uh, uh, high resolution layers provided through the uh, Copernicus uh, that Copernicus service, uh, basic, uh, more specifically, its subgroup forests provides us information about uh, tree cover density, dominant leaf type, and forest types across Europe, as you can see in the image. Uh, Oricon, 
uh, has actively participated in the creation or, or verification of all uh, iterations of high uh, resolution layers and of Corinne land cover maps, which are also, as many of you, of you probably know, a very important source of knowledge about land cover and land, land cover change dynamics. More about uh, our company. OICON is one of the leading institutions in Croatia in the field of study of forest ecosystems uh, done through using remote sensing tools. Our experts have more than 30 years of experience in that field, of course, not me or many of my colleagues, but we are getting there slowly but surely. Uh, just a quick run through uh, uh, of far the more interesting projects. Uh, for example, we have done forest type classifications and volume assessments just from Sentinel-2 imagery, so just from, uh, from multispectral imagery. It has been done uh, nationwide and we have some very, very interesting results there. Uh, of course, the, uh, it has been done uh, using the machine learning algorithms. Uh, again, one of the most important parameters in management of forest ecosystems by national administrations is the carbon stock, the carbon stock of, of forests in a country. We have done it for the entire uh, area of Croatia. It has been done using remote sensing tools. Since OICON is not purely a consultancy, we are also a certified research institute Many of our projects are purely scientific in nature. Uh, the presented uh, animation uh, is from a PhD done by my colleague Zirinka Mesic, who you have uh, seen earlier in the presentation about nature conservation. Uh, one of her results is the uh, dynamics of, uh, beach, uh, of beach forest leafing. So basically the influence of ge geomorphological parameters on phenologic dynamics of beach forests in Dinaric Alps, so uh, parts of Croatia and that region, uh, also parts of Slovenia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, vegetation periods and phenology parameters are very important in understanding uh, forest, uh, forest ecosystems. As uh, a colleague, my colleague said earlier, uh, one of the biggest pests and invasive species that not biggest in in uh, in ge geometric terms but biggest in the problems it causes uh, is the oak lace bug oak lace bug uh, is a pest that attacks oak forests uh, and is becoming a huge huge stress threat to oak forests in europe it has been introduced in croatia in 2014 uh, from the eastern part of croatia Yes, but using Earth observation data, in this case Sentinel-2 data and MODIS data, enabled us not only to find out where uh, the oak lace bug has attacked, but also to conclude its way of travel, its way of spreading. If you look at the image, you can see uh, the pattern of spreading of the, of the bug. Uh, is following uh, the ma a major highway in Croatia that is used for transporting logs on trucks to the rest of the Europe. So basically what happened, we concluded from the EO, EO data, is that uh, infest, infested logs have been uh, uh, put on transportation on, on, on trucks and were driven to the rest of Europe. But when the drivers stopped on truck stops to have a rest, those beetles uh, managed to go out of, out of the logs and attack uh, healthy, le uh, healthy trees that are nearby. So basically that's the way it's, it spreads. Not only the way it spreads, but only, of course, the effect, we also study the effect of it on the Spachva oak forest. Spachva oak forest is the biggest basin of oak forest in, in Europe. And uh, uh, we have uh, used Earth observation data to verify our uh, conclusion that is done by terrestrial uh, measurements, by ground, ground shooting the data, that uh, average of uh, chlorophyll in the entire forest area is continuously falling uh, ever since the beetle, the bug has uh, been uh, introduced in 2014. Of course, uh, since we have a number of high school students following following our presentations and maybe even younger people. We would like to say something about possible educational options in Croatia 
for uh, joining this type of work. Uh, there is uh, the possibility of studying at the Faculty of Geodesy and the University of Zagreb. Also, the Faculty of Forestry and Faculty of Science at the University of Zagreb are heavily uh, deal heavily with earth observation and remote sensing. Also, there are some uh, options outside Croatia, outside Zagreb, and for example, you can always uh, choose the Faculty of Civil Engineering, Architecture, and Geodesy at the University of Split. Of course, there is always an option of joining us at Unigis, Unigis uh, at Zagreb. Uh, to, we are a host of the UniGIS program, and you can study geoinformatics with us. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I hope we'll see each other, each other soon uh, during the Q&A. Okay, so thank you very much, the full OICON team, uh, having Zrinka, Ivona, Ivan, Branimir, and Professor Kushan on board, and thank you for the presentation, as well as Stanislav from Kreodias for the very lively described case studies and data um, uh, illustrations. Um, during the presentations, participants submitted many questions uh, in English, but also in Croatian. So if I may give you the floor and then if you could answer those questions and um, feel free to add comments or to address any relevant topics. And may I ask the participants to post the questions in a very brief manner uh, to limit the questions in about one or two sentences. Uh, thank you very much. And I give the floor to the ICON team. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, uh... Well, to start with the questions, we did a short selection of the questions, uh, the most the ones that covered the most field. So Anna asked, uh, could you please tell us in which uh, cases you use MODIS and Lensa data and for what purposes do you use Sentinel-2? If Sentinel-2 has better resolution, why not just use that? Well, uh, Anna, thank you for the question. Uh, Sometimes uh, bigger resolution doesn't help us. Uh, uh, bigger resolution, of course, needs much more data, much more complex data. And that is great for uh, for some things, but in, for other problems, you need to look for the whole forest habitat. Uh, that could be uh, as big as a region in a country. So uh, in those cases, you need a more general overview of the area and in those cases you use uh, the data that has uh, rougher resolution. Uh, but today more and more as we said in the presentation Sentinel-2 is becoming the standard and it's getting it's, it's used most, more, more and more so basically Copernicus data is the go-to data. I hope that that answers your question. Uh, I think I think my colleague Ivan will Okay, I'll read the next question. Uh, so, uh, Mira asks, uh, have you tested your only three counts with brown fruit? Uh, I believe that refers to the agricultural part, so I leave the field to Ivan and Ivona. Someone from you? Uh, uh, hi, Mira. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, we tested the three counts with brown fruit. Uh, we did that in several locations. Uh, uh, within the country of Croatia, and the test results show, so far show about 80% accuracy. So that's quite a good result and the output for us. But um, for the final stuff, of course, uh, we need to completely finish uh, the project and then we're going to see the, the full number. Um, there's also a question from Anna, and it says regarding the tree count, did you already manage to get the results for the whole country? And if yes, how long did that take? Uh, did this process take to process such data? And I would ask my colleague Ivona and Zizha to answer this. Uh, thank you, Anna, Ivan. Uh, yes, uh, we did uh, the whole uh, Croatia, the whole country, and it took uh, the analysis took uh, about three days uh, for the, uh, at the national level. Uh, so this is it from the questions in English language. There was one question submitted. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a question submitted in Croatian. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, because we have a number of viewers from Croatia watching the Croatian uh, stream, uh, we will answer the question in Croatian and then translate the question in English and also answer that. Znači, srednja škola Martija Antidjeković je poslala pitanje koja je najbolja rezolucija snimaka koja moramo preuzeti u Kopernikus. 
Uh, od Copernicusa je predpostavljeno da se pitanje odnosi na Sentinel program. Uh, ono što se najviše koristi je Sentinel 2, optički sustavi, i tu su nam daleko, uh, tu nam najbolju rezoluciju imaju uh, kanali, uh, RGB kanali, kada oni imaju rezoluciju 10 metara. Znači, jedan piksel na terenu je 10 puta 10 metara. E, ostali e, kanali multispektralnog senzora imaju rezoluciju 20 20 puta 60 puta 60 metara, ali većinom koristimo ovaj 10 puta 10 metara. Dakle, nadam se da, da je to, to zavoljavajući odgovor. Uh, so, now in English, uh, high school Matijan Kudirekovic uh, asked a question. Uh, what is the best resolution of the images that you can get uh, from Copernicus? I believe uh, that question refers to Sentinel data and more exactly Sentinel 2 data. And uh, basically, the best, the best mm-hmm. resolution for a certain set of bands of Sentinel 2 data is 10 by 10 bits. So, those are uh, used most. Uh, but As the question is related to getting uh, Sentinel data, getting access to Copernicus data, maybe uh, maybe Stanislav from Cloud Ferro, the operators of Creo Diaz, can add something more to the, to the answer. Uh, thank you, Branimir, for uh, for pointing to me. Uh, currently, uh, within the uh, Sentinel satellite family, there are um, four. Uh, three, four uh, different platform, satellite platforms, and uh, they vary strongly uh, in the types of data they produce. As Branimir has mentioned, the highest spatial resolution available within the Copernicus diocese, which are the platforms for data dissemination and computing, is uh, 10 by 10 meters for Sentinel-2. Uh, spatial resolution for other satellites uh, differs quite uh, strongly because of uh, uh, a different application types that are that are designed to use them. For example, uh, Sentinel 5P uh, has spatial resolution of seven by seven kilometers, uh, which is a bit more. But those uh, those products are used for atmospheric analysis uh, and but all the data can be easily accessed with all the all the information within the Creo Dias platform which is one of the dioceses thank you uh, for your time thank you brother thank you Stanislav. uh martin do we have uh, do we have one more question that popped out do we have time oh, i believe we do Uh, so we got a question from Marika. Uh, what you know? Uh, how do we deal with cloud mass complications? Basically, that depends on the data we use. We uh, we use we, uh, either uh, use uh, uh, co- uh, composites, multi-day composites that uh, take only the pixels that are not covered with clouds. So that in that way we eliminate the clouds. And for other studies, for um, for example, Sentinel-2, I mean, most of our studies are uh, done over a longer period of time, in uh, one vegetation season, a couple of years, and stuff like that. So we have a large, uh, we can choose a large number of data, a large set of data that contain no clouds. So basically, that's how we deal with those situations. And also using some, uh, some online tools, using some Uh, programs we can do our own composite source and you know, data that are in our cloud. Uh, okay, so Nordin had a question for EO uh, data analysis. May I use image processing techniques for machine learning? Which is the best and what is the main difference? Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, okay, so, so you want yeah, to I can jump in yeah. for this one. Um, well, it all depends on how large is the data set you wish to process. Uh, usually the regular image processing techniques uh, do sometimes take some time and you really do, you do need to be there and take a look at what's going on. Um, these are, uh, they, they could be used also for larger areas, but you're going to spend a lot of time checking the data. Machine learning, on the other hand, um, will take quite a lot of your time to prepare the whole thing, but once you have it, you just feed the system and get out the, the extracted information. 
Um, which is the best? Uh, well, I can't say one or the other because each of them has its own benefits and losses. Um, the, well, basically the main difference, I don't know, I, I can't say that there's some extreme main difference that we can point out. It just depends on what you feel more secure working with. So we like to use mostly image processing techniques and then we back them up using machine learning. And then we always like to check one and the other and then see what we can take from each of these and then merge it together. So my answer to kind of su sum it up would be, I would probably say don't use one or the other, but if you have the chance and the possibility, try using both. Because usually what you get at the end, the best thing would be merging the two worlds and e extracting something that's a, a mashup, let's say, of, of both uh, resources. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, we got some questions, uh, a lot of questions in Croatian uh, that I believe that we don't have time to answer. So uh, if I might refer everyone who wants to get some more information about that project, so all the things that you they can contact us directly at any time. So I think that's that's it from the questions. Uh, Mark time, what do you think? Do you have anything else? Yes, thank you, Baran Um I got I got one more. Uh, maybe you could address this as well. If one if people want to reach out to get additional information, is there an internet address or email address which they can use? Yes, they can contact us uh, on the email address oikon at oikon.hr and they can refer any questions they, they might have. They will be uh, answered promptly and the best of our ability. Okay, and also for... They can contact us, well, sorry, my kind uh, on Facebook or any other social media, share the same. Okay, very good. And uh, Kreodios, Stanislav, how can they reach out to you, to Kreodios? Uh, the best way for all interested in for accessing uh, us to ask questions is to go to the creodias.eu webpage where you where we host a extensive knowledge base and uh, where all the communication channels are available such as uh, emails or live chats and stuff like that so I invite anyone interested in the uh, data and computing for EO. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, this brings us to the end of the demonstration session in collaboration with Oikon and Creodias. Um, Ivan, Ivana, Branimir, Professor Fushan, Zrinka and Stanislav, thank you for your input. All the participants, thanks for joining us in this session. Um, may I get back to you uh, with the introduction of um, uh, we got for this session, because a lot of challenges were mentioned, which can be solved with the use of the diocese and the Copernicus data sets. So we hope we, we inspired you in this session and uh, you can contribute to, uh, to a better world. And uh, well, this closes off this session. And I hope you really will bear with us for the last two sessions of the Eyes on Earth Roadshow, which run in parallel and starting both at approximately 20 to 3 this afternoon. So thanks again. Have a pleasant day and thank you for joining. Bye bye.